Today, we're going to build a tower defense boss fight in vanilla Minecraft. How is it going, everybody? My name's Avid, and boy, do we have a lot of work to do today. As many of you already know, we make adventure maps here. For instance, we made a Beat Saber clone that leads players all the way down to the deep mines, which when they get there, they are greeted by this absolutely enormous dark gate, which inside there is an entire system for custom potion making, the dark gate itself, and the puzzle that is required to open it. This thing is truly magnificent. Once players go through that portal, they make their way to the gateway, which then leads to interdimensional hole in the wall. And the final section of our tunnel is known as the ephemeral platforms. And as you can tell, ephemeral means they are temporary. They disappear as I walk away from them. But one commenter very astutely pointed out that this mechanic is it's kind of boring. And I agreed with this comment so much that I decided to do a four and a half hour live stream to build out the new mechanics of the ephemeral platforms, which I think is so much cooler and so much better. And the way that they work is there are these alien chandeliers that dang from the ceiling and much like the ore seeker potion from the last section that we worked on in the prior episodes you shoot it with a mining arrow and that breaks that alien bubble at the end of the chandelier, which then reveals the next section of the platforms. But here you can see they are draining particles and that kind of is showing that they are revealing the platforms that are beneath them. Thank you so much for that comment, Pi Guy. And finally, to cap off our tunnel, I created an interdimensional portal that Oh, it looks something like this and it's so cool. Uh, warning, if you experience any uh, seizures or things for flashing lights, probably look away. I should have said that before I started this clip. And so with our tunnel 100% complete, it is now time to build the boss room that lies in the other side dimension. So let's go. Did I just spend two and a half hours making an entrance hall to a boss room? Yes, <laughs> yes I did. But you know what, it was totally worth it. I mean, look at this thing. We have a fish tank up above in the diffused lighting in all of this really cool extraterrestrial, extra dimensional foliage all around. Now the thing is we do need to finish up the boss room itself so I can get on with this video, but for that, I'm gonna try something a little different. So here we go. Like every great boss room, I started with a giant hole. I envisioned a ceiling that resembled the cosmic microwave background of the universe. I came up with a randomizer system that allowed me to scatter bits and bobs of dangly extra dimensional alien bits across the ceiling. But of course, that ceiling needed to be a focal point of the build. I wanted it to almost resemble an otherworldly sky. So I resorted to some unique tactics with decaying leaves and water, which ended up turning out beautifully. When the ceiling was complete, it was then time to lay the track for our evil creatures to meander their way towards the central platform, just like in any tower defense game. And inspired by the water from the ceiling, I decided to use a new technique to paint the walls with this organic matter that encased the room in giant otherworldly vines. With some final touches to the track and central platform, our work was complete. And we were able to stand back and appreciate just what we had done. Well guys, 
guys, what do you think of this amazing boss room? I am so, so happy with how it turned out. And I know I'm going to get a lot of comments on, hey, you were going to make a whole other side dimension in a data pack. I thought you said that. Yes. <laughs> My plan is eventually other side is going to be a full fledged dimension, but for now, we have made a pocket dimension of other side, which is going to contain our boss fight. And now the only thing left to do is to build the boss fight, which if you can see behind me, we have already started a little bit of effort on the towers that are going to go into the tower defense game. Now I made these towers on a live stream and I'll be honest, they need some work. Fortunately for me, one of the members of my Discord by the name Brizoza thought that they could make some better towers, and oh my gosh, they were right. With only a few modifications from me, these are the towers of our boss room. We have your classic ranger tower, which will shoot arrows or particle beams at monsters as they walk along the track. Then you have the lookout towers, which will highlight and weaken monsters, making them vulnerable to player attacks. Every tower defense game has to have a freeze tower. Ours will slow down enemies in a certain radius. The next towers are one-time use and will explode when hit with a mining arrow. They are very tactical and very deadly. These towers help the player slowly earn currency each wave. We'll get more into currency in a moment, but it helps players buy more towers. And finally, this is a secret tower whose function will be revealed towards the end of the video. You probably have already guessed why there are three variants of each tower. Well, basically, we're going to support the upgrading of each tower from level one all the way up to level three, with level three towers either doing more base damage, having a larger area of effect, giving the player more gold, or uh, see if you can guess what this special tower is going to do down in the comments, and we'll see if you're right by the end of the video. Oh, there's no way you're going to guess it, though maybe that's just because I don't even know what it's going to do. All right, all right. All right, we need to get to the plan here. So we're like eight minutes into this video and we haven't even talked about what our plan is yet. So we have the boss room and the tower design. Ooh, they look so good. All done, but we have so much work left to do. Oh gosh. So let's talk a little bit about the tower placement system, which is just a fancy way to say, how are players going to place down towers at the designated locations all throughout this map? And one idea I had was to have armor stands that the player can be given through a trade with some kind of vendor, and they are able to place down those armor stands, and this will then clone in the structure block, the tower is going to be summoned in, and then the structure block is destroyed with the redstone, and you know what? I think we can do better than that. For one, what if we just cut out the middleman and gave players in adventure mode these structure blocks that had the NBT data and they just place the structure block down? That might be the way to do it. But the real question is, can a player in adventure mode actually place a structure block? Like for instance, this one is allowed to be placed on redstone, but if I, ah, oh, dang it, if I'm right clicking, it doesn't let me place it. But does that mean we have to resort to the armor stand idea? No, I'm stubborn and I can't get this out of my head now. And I actually think we could do it with a little bit of spawn egg magic. Okay, so hear me out. Now, spawn eggs are usually used to spawn in monsters like this blaze here but you can also overwrite what that spawn egg is going to summon in, and you can actually set it to be a falling block with NBT data, so I could make it spawn in the structure block. But can I place a spawn egg in adventure mode? <gasps> yeah, I'm not in adventure mode. <clears throat> but can I place a spawn egg in adventure mode? Yes, yes I can, but there's no tower. I kind of suspected this, and so I think you have to actually update the block and then the redstone will trigger the structure block. And look, I'm in adventure mode and I just placed a tower. Hmm, this might actually work. And by using an observer hooked up to a command block, 
we can actually set a redstone block whenever a structure block is placed, which means we have our tower placement system. Future editor Avid here, and it turns out that most players can't actually use this technique to place structure blocks for security purposes, so I ended up using the spawn egg to summon in a tagged armor stand, which I then target with the place command. Now back to you, past Avid. And with that out of the way, now it's time to look at how we're going to do upgrades. So I've come up with the concept of upgrade modules. And the way that these work is there is a tier two and tier three upgrade module. Tier twos can be placed on iron blocks and tier threes can be placed on gold blocks. And so what I've done is I've tucked a structure block for tier two inside of the tier one structure. Basically what this means is players can purchase towers and then they can purchase upgrade modules. And we see here that a tier three upgrade module can't be placed on iron, so you can't put it on a tier one tower. But if you put a tier two upgrade module on it and you press the button, you upgrade your tower. And tier two towers can be upgraded to tier three. And with just a couple of particles and sound effects, our upgrade system is done. And while this third row is steadily growing with more things that I'm realizing I'll need to do, there's one thing that is going to keep me up at night. I have no idea how we are going to solve the mob AI. After all, there are lots of ways to influence the Minecraft mob AI, such as using turtle eggs with zombies. But that does dramatically limit the mobs that we can use because, well, skeletons don't seem to care. Now, there's also the option of using armor stands with the teleport command to kind of convince a zombie to walk towards the nearest armor stand. But this comes with a bunch of limitations, like slowness potions don't do anything in this case. And just when I thought all hope was lost, I came upon a little bit of knowledge about the wandering trader. What? Where'd you go? And it turns out that in the data of the wandering trader, you can actually set a wander location. We can actually update the wander target of the wandering trader dynamically. So if I push this button here, he's now gonna wander over to that platform. And while this is so incredibly satisfying, I am starting to realize there are a couple of problems with my wandering trader strategy. Problem number one is related to the time of day. You see, when it's nighttime, they all drink invisibility potions, which normally would be fine. I want them to be invisible, that's great. But if we set the time back to day, then they drink milk. And so technically, I guess I could never make them invisible, which means every monster has to ride a visible wandering trader, which try to lure that one away. The second and more concerning yet hilarious problem is when a mob rides a wandering trader, it attacks the wandering trader. <laughs> and so even if the wandering trader <laughs> is invulnerable, uh, eventually the AI goes crazy and doesn't listen to where to wander to. So as much as it pains me, I think I'm gonna have to go with the waypoint system. So let me try to at least optimize it a little bit and I'll be right back. And what is but a moment for you guys turns out to be about two days for me, but I am so excited to present to you the brain of our mob AI. Let's go see how it works. This entire system is driven by tags. And what I really mean by that is all of the zombies in this room have a tag that tells our system to move them forward in the direction they're facing at a certain speed using the teleport command. And what's cool about that is we can actually change out the tags of the zombies to change the speed that the zombies are walking. So that's perfect for our freeze tower and for mobs that can move faster than the normal zombies. Now, there's also a second set of tags that we're watching that control which direction the zombies are facing. And so if you notice here, we're about to hit a waypoint. When we step on this pressure plate, we're, we're inside of a zombie right now, if you didn't get that. Um, when we step on that pressure plate, we get a new tag that points us in the direction of the next 
waypoint. Check this out. I have a horde of zombies that I was stockpiling over at that waypoint. And look at them all go. I mean, imagine if we summoned in a horde of these guys as part of one of the waves. And watch this, when they hit this pressure plate, they all ding, 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 ding. <laughs> That is so cool. And what else is cool is I have a basic wave system working, which essentially spawns in monsters of increasing difficulty from the east and west sides of the room. And when all of the monsters are defeated, we then move on to the next wave. And I only have one wave so far. But that does mean we have our wave system figured out and our AI. And also I have come up with a bunch of monsters, which you'll see at the end of the video. And with the mob system complete, it is now time to start on our towers. I've started by making a couple of scoreboard timers to handle when the projectiles are fired from the ranger towers. Then in sync with each of those timers, we'll summon in an armor stand at the top of any of these ranger towers if there's a monster in range. That armor stand will track monsters and explode on impact. And I am so excited to test this out. Oh my gosh, you guys, the tower system works perfectly. Check this out. We have a bunch of towers here of different tiers. So these are level ones, level twos, level threes. I think I'm calling them diamond tier, gold tier. And so all you have to do is place down one of the towers to start attacking the monsters. And then we can upgrade this one to gold tier first. And that increases the range, increases the attack speed and a little bit of the damage. And what's so cool about this is I'm also indicating the range of the towers by this little particle circle. This is the coolest thing I have ever made. And that is our ranger tower. And we're going to do a lightning round for the next five towers here. So sit back, relax and enjoy this little montage. Oh man, these lookout towers are so cool. The different tiered lookout towers weaken the monsters more and more based on the level of the tower. And so what's really cool about this mechanic is it incentivizes players to get out there and start fighting the monsters themselves rather than just sitting back and letting their towers do the work. The slow towers are working magnificently and look at all the monsters we have on the screen right now. The three towers have different ranges and you notice whenever monsters are in the area, they have this little snow effect around them. So the tower picks one of the monsters in its radius at random and applies an extra slow effect. I feel like a mad scientist with these bomb towers. They are honestly so cool. So the first tier isn't anything crazy. It does take out some of these low level mobs pretty easily. But then if we upgrade to tier two here, it gets a bit beefier. The explosion lasts a little longer and it's a little bit larger of a radius and that just cleared out the whole corner. But then there is the tier three version of this, which kind of terrifies me a little bit, but here we go. Oh! <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, that's gonna be kind of hard to follow up, but I, I do have the gold towers. These are important towers because they grant players the currency of this boss, the other side shards, which help them buy more towers. And finally, I finished up the crystal towers and they actually spawn on their own on these special platforms here. And every wave that they are not dealt with they upgrade, <laughs> that's so cool. See if you can guess what they're doing. Also, I protect players from falling now by using a whole bunch of barrier blocks. And I also have this particle effect that makes it look like players are floating above the void. And that means a huge chunk of our board is out of the way. And before I start these final items, I kind of want to revisit the wave system because I got an amazing idea while on a stream. So right now our waves are very manually defined, meaning I'm gonna have to plug every single monster that spawned into a command block to spawn them in on the west and east sides, separate everything with repeaters, and it's just not scalable. So imagine if instead we were able to define our entire wave by putting items into a chest like this. And our monsters that are spawned are the spawn eggs and our breaks between those monsters are pretty much any other item. And with a little bit of redstone, it turns out that is incredibly simple. So all we have here is an automatic dispenser firing mechanism. And if I take this chest filled with spawn eggs and then gold blocks, 
put it on top of this hopper, then we start to get the mobs spawning in at certain rates and it works exactly as expected. Now, we have to figure out what to do with all the gold blocks, but otherwise, I'm pretty sure this is like 99% of the way there. And I've gotta give credit to Lucas again for this one because this was all their idea. And so, with a little bit of time and some fine tuning, look at our wave system now. So each of our waves can now be defined in these chests here with wave one being all the way to the left and wave 35 being all the way at the end. And we can make our waves progressively harder by just adding more of these spawn eggs. And what's really cool is I've extended that to our reward system. So now each wave, the reward here, it will be cloned down to the downstairs area. And I also have this fanciness. You see, these colored blocks actually change what happens at the beginning of the waves. So if, for instance, the armor stand is standing on top of this amethyst block, we will actually summon in one of our question mark evil towers. The iron block stands for a horde wave, the diamond block stands for a boss wave, and the netherite block indicates it's the final wave. And what's so cool about this is it not only shows a custom title to the player based on just what block the armor stand is standing above or right next to, but also if I wanted to spawn a question mark tower on this wave, I just place down an amethyst block there. That's all it takes to configure this. And so all I should have to do is start the wave like that and look, Horde wave. While it's not a very intimidating horde at higher level waves, it certainly is going to be. So we are just about ready to do a trial run of this tower defense game, but there are a couple little items to button up first. So the first thing is we need to come up with an area where players can trade the other side shards for towers, upgrades, and this fancy looking button here, which is called a crystal eradicator. And these can be placed on these question mark evil towers to destroy them. And have you guys figured out what these towers do yet? And of course, we can't forget that we need to create the very thing that players are here to protect. It is, of course, the orb, which is now 100% done. Finally, I did a bunch of work off camera here and I have this kind of particle generator that's creating this beautiful white orb in the center of our platform. But what's cooler is when monsters interact with the orb, it kills the monster and subtracts that monster's health from the scoreboard that shows the orb's health up above as a boss bar. And also you can see that it changes colors based on how much health the orb has and it's perfect, I love it. After each wave, loot gets dropped into this twinkling chest here. And when you remove the loot, the chest no longer twinkles. And I brought the same twinkliness to this button here that allows players to start the next wave. And over here, I have one of the two traders that I have planned. And what's cool is if I right click on this trader, they're not not a villager, but I'm able to bring up this trade interface, which I still need to balance. I, I don't know yet what the towers and mo upgrade modules and all that are going to cost, but I'm doing a really neat trick here. So first off, this is a skeleton that I dressed up with a player head and some leather armor. And then there is a villager that is constantly being teleported in front of where this skeleton is facing. So if I go over here, the villager now is teleported in front of the skeleton. And that guarantees that when I right click on this character here, it's always going to open up the villager interface. I don't know if you've tried to put a head on a villager before, but it uh, ends up looking something like this, where the nose pokes out and it's hilarious. And with the board mostly completed, I want to show you guys what the room looks like when it is filled to the brim with towers. And just before we unleash the horde on these magnificent towers, I mean, look at how beautiful this is. It's so cool. I just wanted to say that this video took me about 90 hours across three weeks. <laughs> so if you guys would leave a like or comment or subscribe, that would help out the channel more than you can imagine. All right, that's enough YouTube blah, blah, blah. Let's blow up some monsters. Taking a step back and looking at this room in action, it actually blows my mind just how awesome it is. I mean, look at this bomb explode in the whole corner. All the zombies are just gone. Like, just wow. And then you have the question mark tower. What that's actually doing is it's disabling nearby towers. I told you I would tell you. 
Guys, can you believe that this is one of 35 waves in this tower defense boss? Now, if you want to see the other 34 waves or you're curious about the story of Nodak and the other side dimension, then stay tuned for episode 13. But until then, I'll see you all next time. Bye bye.